So give us a, a little bit more as to, you know, why semantic and knowledge graph solution. Right. Let's jump to it. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Then let's go ahead. So what it's all about. Um, the story where we as a company and I specifically discovered the entire semantic cosmos out there and where it can be useful, software supply chain. And in order to um, kind of lead you through that, what we did and why we did and how we did, uh, at first I want to start with, hey, uh, who the heck we are? Because you, the name sound might, may sound familiar back from the good old days where we were there in um, you know, the top register of smartphone business. Um, but he, they, these days are over, as anybody, as everybody knows. So you might have the thinking now, hey, um, are these guys still alive? Um, it's funny to see the name, what they do. Right after that, I quickly want to discover with you uh, what were the initial pain points, which forced us basically to say, hey, we need to change. We need to change something if we really want to go down that path. The third um, area is then the approach which we took in order to resolve the pain points. And number four, finally, is some sort of an outlook because, as Steve introduced, um, it's kind of a catalyst for way more things and, and things way beyond the initial supply chain core which we started with. So first, um, what do we do these days? as a company. So we're still active in communications service provider solution offerings. So when you are picking up your phone and making a call in many places in the world, the technology which sits behind that um, is either coming from us or from some of our competitors. Um, you may know of all of them. And so the big guys in the game, uh, Huawei, Ericsson and Nokia, so that's where we have a big stake, um, getting telecom um, stuff, tech stacks, hardware, software services, uh, integration services to our um, customers, which enable them to offer you the services of connectivity you are using. The second big sector industry in public. Um, so um, everybody knows what's up there in, you know, industry for the and that type of stuff. So everybody in the industry and public sector is also getting more and more keen on, okay, we need to connect things. We need to connect information, devices, um, monitoring, sensing, all these things. Of course, there um, we have a stake in providing the backend technology to connect all of these areas. And last but not least, licensing. Uh, so we hold major licenses of um, a vast variety of communication areas, so essential, essential patents in uh, the telecoms area as such, um, up there from the base um, essential functionalities of your smartphone and connecting to the base stations into very highly sophisticated um, overarching standardization pieces of um, yeah the 5G um, portfolio and beyond. So that's basically what we still do, how are we doing that? Um, we have like four major business pillars. First one being mobile networks, as the name might indicate, that's everything which is mobile, everything around the radio, radio access, all of that stuff. Then we have our guys from cloud and network services. That's then the core of our network. Um, architecture which we offer to the customers. So the core network solutions, um, some cognitive services, the enterprise and public sector is running underneath that pillar. As a third one, there is network infrastructure. That's where we cover um, the IP, the routing, optical networks, um, still the submarine tasks. So whenever, for example, we need to do some stuff, um, at the long and fancy lines across the big pond so that we guys from Europe can do what we do right here and connect with you guys over there in the States. That's where the submarine networks team is getting in the game. And then last but not least technologies. That's basically where all the licensing uh, relies. So that's quickly what we as a company do. What do all these pillars have in common? To a majority, we all use software, everything software driven. 
And of course, that software needs to end up at our customers in some form. In best case, as we are all used to it, we want to make it every, everything automated, everything integrated, everything embedded. Um, you want to connect all your R&D pipes directly to your customer. So that's that's what we are expected to do. But you can imagine, okay, we have not been there at the beginning. So what were our initial pain points when we started to digitize that entire journey? Um, three major pain point areas which we had in our business before we started um, our journey here. The supply chain is such, the product lineup, which we are selling and delivering to our customers, and then getting knowledge out of the products which are there running in the field, so in product analytics. The two major components I will cover in this one because that's where the semantic really is the essential catalyst for everything is area number one and three. So the software supply chain as such and in product analytics. Um, so starting with the first one, we simply had a very scattered, complex and slow supply chain. So not a lot of automation. Um, people were still downloading software, getting them onto our sites, uh, to the base stations, rolling out stuff. Um, so when you were um, getting new um, and base stations, new um, network pillars out there, connecting, for example, new um, countryside towns, you know, so getting new subscribers, building up a new network. Um, in many, many cases, we had huge de initial deployment lead times. Yeah? So imagine like up around 90 days until the software was finally running there and everything was connected. So it was simply just crazy. Then the next thing, revenue leakage. Yeah? We were simply not having the capabilities to be aware of uh, how are our products handled and used within the customer networks. Um, are they used in the way they are contracted and purchased to be used? Um, and then we have seen major revenue leakage potential there with hundreds of millions of potential revenue losses there. The entire internal process landscape was totally fragmented. Um, alongside all of our business groups and insights into what exactly is happening at each of the supply chain um, process um, chains um, was not really given. At area number three, there was simply nothing at all. Uh, so we were not able to really make use of um, how are our products performing there in the field. Um, we, we did not have any metering. There was no integrated data backhaul so that we could integrate um, with any piece of information from our products out there in the field. Um, no common data strategy to really make use of potential insights. Huh? Um, not even speaking of those four business pillars I was um, explaining in, in the previous slide, sharing data across the boundaries of the business groups to really, you know, make cross-sell, up-sell opportunities possible. Um, that was simply not there. Yeah? So we had major ground to cover. How did we do it? First thing, okay, um, something has to change. So let's envision some process. And um, we then came to the conclusion, okay, basically, if we see it in a pragmatic manner, everything around our business is in quotation marks, nothing else than knowledge. Knowledge around the processes, about the products, the customers, the network architecture, um, all the complexity. It's basically nothing else than knowledge, which to most of the degree is out there, but not in a digitized format and definitely not in a linked manner. And that's where it was pretty obvious to us that, okay, if we want to change something, let's do it right for the first time. And let's try to digitize that knowledge and get, and get it into a linked data format, which means radically changing everything, um, building up from scratch a semantic knowledge graph layer, including data integration and linking capabilities, completely from, from scratch, building up ontologies and all your taxonomies you need, all the data models. So it was a, you can imagine that it was a hell of an effort. But we really took the decision 
a very bold decision. Um, at the end, it paid off, um, but more to that later. The bold decision, okay, we need to go down that path um, because if we are not starting to do it right now, we will never make it. So that was the central starting point for it all to, to begin. A linked data and knowledge graph layer um, to build the fundament for all our business segments, unifying really everything and enable all of the beauties that you have with, uh, yeah, with, with such a setup. Around that, what has to what has to evolve over time, and which uh, was carried out, of course, in close cooperation with all our product lines and R and D centers across the world. Um, some elements which we have to cover: licensing and security is one point. I was talking about revenue leakage, so our linked data and knowledge layer has to be able to control licensee, um, licensing and security aspects of our product solutions. Entitlement management as such from a commercial perspective. And so controlling contracting situations between us and our customers, controlling subscriptions, controlling the metering aspects. Um, if you have, for example, a, a pay as you use kind of business model. So all of that stuff, um, co controlling and orchestrating who is entitled to use what, when, where, and how. Delivery and update, that's of course where um, this, the intersection to our R&D pipes is coming in. So we need to closely integrate and cooperate with our product lines who are there and developing, building the actual software. And last but not least, the analytics piece. Yeah? We need to make use of all the data and all the knowledge that we generate around this process in a continuous manner, within that process in a continuous manner, and by taking in um, data from the outside. So that's what we had to do from a process perspective. What was basically the solution? Um, as I said, we created a ecosystem of a linked data and, and digital knowledge layer um, and connected it to all the important data uh, um, pieces uh, which we had there on our existing uh, data landscape, which a, let's say, subset of it uh, I'm, I'm showing here right now. So the goal was really to unify every aspect of knowledge and data that we had in or around our software business, which was useful for us and which we had to take in order to, to, to execute these process steps I was just explaining. So, um, as kind of, um, you know, just, just shortly um, phrasing that out. For example, compliance data. A, a huge aspect of the business we do, um, many of our software products are export control relevant. They are classified because, as you can imagine, um, telecommunication services and solutions have also a broad use in military aspects. So the best example, beginning of last year, when, uh, you know, uh, Russians invaded the Ukraine, all of a sudden, um, there were embargoes, um, sanctions being raised up. You were not allowed to deliver certain kind of solutions um, to the Russian Federation. How do you control it in such an integrated manner? So our solution needs to have insight into that. And then, of course, other compliance relevant data, yeah? security, country specific compliance and privacy um, data. The next big pillar, the entire commercial side of things so contracts marketplaces which we had to connect invoicing and revenue recognition and uh, the entire erp backhaul yeah, so that everything what we do there in our digitized software supply chain which was which is as said based on our um, linked data foundation has to feed back into our erp backhaul um then the next um, big layer software artifacts as such so all of the product lines which we had there, um, which are developing all the solutions we sell to our customers, um, they need to integrate into us. So we need to have insights in really um, what artifacts, software artifacts, what microservices, how are the containers structured that we need to deploy and, and deliver to our customer networks. Uh, so we are really keeping semantic data representations of each and every artifact that leaves our CI/CD pipes 
from our R&D centers all around the world. Um, next one, the entire um, surrounding master data. So um, a lot of the meta master data stuff, customer related stuff, product related stuff, system and solution, com uh, compatibility, matrices, dependencies, all of that stuff. And then last but not least, uh, in product analytics. So of course we need to know um, how do we need to monitor, meter, and take in usage data, performance data, network traffic data. So what are the data points that we can feed back um, from the customer network side in order to link it to, to the rest of the business scenario and make use of it? Um, so all of this, all of these elements have been unified in, in our linked data layer. And it has it has gotten quite quick, uh, quite big, as you can imagine. Um, so I just um, just before the session, I made made a drop of um, how many how many data triples uh, we're currently having in our knowledge graph store. Um, so maybe that's maybe that's some some funny puzzle for you guys. So uh, drop a note in the questions or think about it. Um, just guess how many triples do we do we currently have in our software supply chain linked data store. Let's see who has the right answer at the end. How could such a scenario it look like? Um, what have we actually done? So um, as I said, the entire the entire story was about controlling and orchestrating our software delivery business. Yeah? How do we get the software which Um, was, give me, let me move my pointer up there, which our R&D builds and develops, how do we get that out to the field in a fully automated and integrated manner without any manual intervention needed? At the same side, how do we meter and control and have insights into everything which is happening there at the deployment side of things? So right at our customer network's heart. And of course, whatever happens there on the commercial side, so when Sabandi purchases new features, widens a contract, um, purchases more subscribers to be able to connect it to his network. Um, so all of these events that can happen um, have, of course, um, some, some action as a result in, in, uh, in our orchestration layer, which we need to carry on. And that's where our linked data and, and yeah, Knowledge Graph Foundation is again coming in, because what we do with that is since we have the full data insights from a semantic perspective around all these elements, we are interconnecting all these elements, but at the same time, keeping them separated enough so that they can do what they are supposed to do. To do. So the sales guys, they don't need to understand what um, the R&D cracks and nerds are doing there. And they, at the same, uh, same story, they don't need to understand how um, the sales guys are um, selling their, um, their the software that these guys develop because we serve that purpose of integrating all of that. Uh, we link all of that together. Um, and that entire story um, that started very small, so with a team of like five guys, um, I started that entire thing. Nowadays, we are closely to around 30 people. Um, and every, every day, every month, uh, we're getting more of our R&D lines on board, more customers are interested in utilizing that platform and getting use of it. And uh, more internal business groups are jumping on that. So that's like that's like the main, the main, the main use case which we started semantics with, uh, because that's where we had the biggest pain points. Uh, how do we integrate these three totally different worlds but at the same time, keep them separated enough so that they can focus on their area of expertise. What have we then achieved? So right now, I think it's uh, four years in the making till we started. So from from really from scratch was a group, totally green table. Um, up until now, it's been four years. Um, we have moved into a fully integrated and finally unified supply chain. So there is one platform to orchestrate the outputs of all of our R&D 
um, CICD pipes and directly integrating them into our customer networks. We have cut down deployment lead times uh, to around three days for our very huge solutions. Um, we have generated around 300 million euro of additional revenue per year due to the yeah, upsell and cross-sell opportunities we could open up by having access to knowledge in a semantically and digitized format. We finally have a unified process landscape. So all our products are delivered by using the standardized business logics that we have implemented on top our semantic layer. And finally, we have complete supply chain insights, knowing what is happening, when it is happening, when something's getting wrong. Um, so finally, full insights into that. Also from in-product analytics, now we are able to really make use of real-time metering. We have a continuous backhaul out there in the field um, and we can make use of the knowledge that we gather there in an integrated manner. So no manual reportings and what else not. Yeah? Um, you have access to the knowledge you need to know whenever you need to know. Um, finally, we have our data orchestration, the mess that we had at the beginning centralized um, and maybe the most greatest thing of all, finally, all these four huge business pillars, um, finally sharing data across all of their segments to make, to make use of, uh, all the, the possibilities. And then last but not least, of course, for all the executive people gathering all these insights into some nice, uh, BI apps and, uh, you know, visualizations. So automating all of that so that you have access to every kind of representation of the business insights you may imagine. What's next, you may ask? Well, of course, there are still lots of ground to cover. So one thing we are heavily working on now is attaching some more intelligence to the data we're having there. Um, in the sense of um, pricing options. So you can imagine if you have a, um, just just, uh, just actually, you know, imagine the Super Bowl is coming up. Um, of course, at that event, you have a massive need of communication in around the stadium, uh, all over the world. So you have a, a specific time frame where you have ultimate peaks in the capacity, in the throughput, in the availability, in latency, in, you know, um, service uptimes you need. Um, wouldn't it be nice if you could offer your customers automatically based on um, AI based analytics, the best possible price tiers so that for your customers, they can have the most optimized pricing tiers available, depending on the capacity they actually use. That's something we currently are not really good at offering to the customers. Yeah, so we cannot customize our offerings on demand based on usage over time and um, generating forecasted AI based traffic profile outlooks, which help you, you know, to, to lower the, the cost footprint from, from their side. And for us, of course, it's network optimization. Yeah? Um, when you have low throughput and you just have low traffic um, on the systems, um, you can pull out capacity. And so it's the other the automated optimization for us. Uh, we're having some stuff in there, but we're not really good at it. The ultimate goal, based on first analysis, if we really take it up to the next level and make use of the semantic insights that we generated there, um, that we can reduce. Um, servicing time, which may be necessary by a lot due to the proactiveness, which we can generate. Energy reduction is the next thing. Eh? Why to keep up everything 100% if you don't need it? Eh? Just imagine how much energy saving it is if the super fall is over and you're, um, you know, you're, you're totally damping down all of your communication um, and network aspects you have running there because nobody's in, having it in use anymore. Yeah? So why to keep it up all the time? And the important thing is that you know that and, and that you can predict that. Same thing, net, network performance. Yeah? 
by um, automatically adjusting um, how and when and where microservices are running and all of these things that we can do nowadays, um, a huge performance boost is expected as well. The next aspect, of course, um, getting it out to stuff besides software as such. Yeah? So the hardware side of things, all the antennas, all the base stations, all the cables, the optics, everything we need, all the items we have um, with all the manufacturing partners uh, we'll work with together. Imagine that we are linking product traceability um, and manufacturing line insights right away from the first screw that is turned into an antenna, um, into an antenna holder right at the beginning of the, the, the product line process of the service providers or the manufacturing partners we are working with. Um, the amount of demand forecasting accuracy we can generate automatically by having insights into that. Yeah? And by that overall, just lead, lead time reduction, um, Availability is to be increased of material we need, shortages are to be avoided, um, and, and all of that stuff. Yeah? So first analysis have shown that, yeah, right around um, cutting our um, hardware material product lead times by half, it's in the range of possibilities. And last but not least, selling more and selling differently. Um, we're having now insights into how products are used, when they are used, and how they perform. And um, of course, it would make sense to put analysis on top, to put AI elements on top, to automatically yeah, generate and offer our customers interesting cross and upsell opportunities from their side and from our side, which will be directly embedded into our CRM solutions. There's lots of ground to cover there. And that's what we're in the making. I said the foundation of all of that is why we're all here. Um, it's semantic data. And I think I want to end it on that note. So that's the scale of what you can achieve. Um, if you if you don't think small, so um, if you think big, that's what you can achieve. And there's more ground to cover. Um, yeah, I think we still have some time for some questions, right? Yep. Yeah, Steve dropped one in the chat. Uh, ERP tends to be an extremely complex and customized area. How do you find bringing this information and getting data access from SAP into a linked data layer? Yeah, well, um, that's maybe when I can go back to that slide. Yeah, that helps there. So, um, of course, you're absolutely right. The point was that we came to the strategic decision, finally. It was a hard road to get there. You're, you can imagine um, it, it was like that. You're absolutely right with that. But we came to the strategic decision that we will be the driver for the data strategy as such, meaning that we forced these guys um, to adapt to our master data structure for products, and customers, so so we were the ones dictating um, how the data needs to look like, and we were the ones dictating how the data needs to be um, provided from their side. From an interfacing perspective, as such, they are quite on the okayish side nowadays. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the, the the interface options you have are quite workable. In that sense, so it was easy for us to obtain the data. Yeah. And as soon as they were ready to adopt the data, which um, the, the master data, which we have completely agreed across um, the corporation, then it was kind of an easy deal. But the road to it, that was that was heavy. And the final decision to really go down that, that path, that was, that was the heavy one. Hmm. We had two guesses in relation to the number of triples. Uh, Dave threw out 600 billion triples, and Jonathan Storm threw out 1.7 trillion triples. <laughs> um, the first one is basically the winner. It's right around 750 billion triples. Wow. 
So the 600 was seven, a very good. Point. 7 billion users, 750 billion triples. But then it's getting more and more every day. Uh, uh, mostly due to the fact, as I said, software artifacts. So um, you, you can imagine that uh, we have, um, I think, all in all, over 50,000 R&D engineers working in Nokia. So more than half of the company is just R&D power. And you can imagine what output these guys have. Yeah? So what output of artifacts we are seeing in our artifact repositories each day. And mm -hmm. each single individual artifact is represented as a resource in our linked data layer, yeah. um, it, including many aspects. Yeah? Um, hash sums, all it's everything we need to know in order to orchestrate that software delivery pipe. <clears throat> so that when these guys release something, uh, release an artifact that we can get the bundles together, we can configure products on the fly. And, you know, like if T-Mobile USA being one of our customers, if they are entitled to receive that new version of our, let's say, base station, um, 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 control software that they have it automatically immediately and so that's that's the reason why artifacts and their semantic representation within our ecosystem that's the, the biggest driver of the amount of, of triples we are seeing uh, and that really required us from an architectural perspective to set up a really clusterized um, environment from an infrastructure and hosting perspective to just be able to handle the sheer amount of traffic and data we see. Wow. Do you have any scaling issues? How do you handle this amount of data efficiently? We had at the beginning. That that that, that was a, a, a big issue. Yeah? So, um, but then we really um, made use of the scaling opportunities that you have when operating um, in 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 a cloudified environment so very soon very early we moved from a, from a technology perspective we moved everything into kubernetes clusters so the the ecosystem behind that solution is, is running fully in kubernetes we've make we fully make use of the graph stores concurrent query execution capabilities which lets you spread the query load across um, all of the nodes or multiple nodes in your Kubernetes cluster and getting a solution to work in such a setup, um, that really was when, when it all clicked and which really helped us to propel um, performance and throughput to the next level. Any other questions or hands? Yeah, JT, I'm going to uh, provide just one last question here. Uh, this one is more um, around that topic that you you mentioned, which is a critical one, I think, from uh, an enablement and adoption level, is that you were able to keep some of those domains localized, and, mm -hmm. and, and but you were connecting them in, in the same way. Uh, and I think that's a significant um, uh, aspect of, of that they maintain control of that uh, as well. So maybe you can talk a little bit deeper about that and how how some of the, you know, the governance models and, and how you're, you know, supporting that uh, kind of fit into it. Right. That rightfully said, that was the one of the biggest headaches we had at the beginning to to get a governance and strategy model around that. So it, you have to imagine best example. Let's take let's take a pretty simple piece of information like a customer ID. Um, everybody of us may have different associations of what a customer ID may look like. So in our context, concretely, um, we had SAP systems, uh, we had R&D systems, we had supply chain systems, uh, we had the deployment side of things, uh, we had master data systems, and all of these systems for semantically the same object, they all had different IDs, different, <laughs> different data models to handle that. So it really was a nightmare. Um, especially as you can imagine from from an SAP perspective. So they're being very, very picky with how this stuff needs to look like from, from a data model perspective. And that's why we said, okay, two options. 
either we unify the data model approach at all of these elements itself, or um, we make use of heavy data integration and linking exercises. That's what we finally ended up with, um, because you know the the legacy that we had in the landscape from southbound northbound systems so all of these elements i was just saying there was a huge legacy and just investing money on you know overhauling a 25 year old data model and the solution on top which is fundamenting on that model it was just not worth spending that money so at the end um the burden was up to us and we have took the initiative to make a data integration layer basically around us which serves as the yeah the, really the, the data integration um, framework so that these surrounding systems they're sending in data the way they use it so they don't have to worry about any mapping tables or whatever um we took that entire burden that was a pretty huge burden and <laughs> um as you can imagine but luckily and it's maybe one key piece you need to have we got C-level support in like saying, okay, um, let these guys do what they need to do. Um, they execute um, and we'll have full trust in them that they make it work. At the end of the day, it resulted in us on the, yeah, as a side effect, building the unified data layer, uh, which we now have and which others are now starting to adopt. Eh? So. For example, we're just executing a ERP renewal program, so we will adopt new SAP solutions. And these guys are actually taking in elements right away from our unified data layer, uh, which is totally different than anything they would have come up with if our layer would not have existed. Uh. Um, and so that's the positive thing of it. Uh. So we really kept it separate. We said to everybody, to all the SAPs and all the CRMs and all the configure and pricing tools out there we said okay you can keep your data models you do not need to worry about semantics and all of that stuff but we take the ownership and the governance of the of the unification umbrella which ties the dots together um, so let us build that model um, and when you create something new you report to us so when you create new aspects which are semantically of interest for us you have the obligation to report it so that we can adjust and keep our our knowledge graphs and our ontologies growing and that has been working out fine yeah. um i think the major reason was that they were seeing okay i don't have any effort besides reporting to you what i'm doing there and you will make the magic happen so easily spoken that was that that's why they adopted to it because that was the beauty for them so was that a, a change in their behavior as well then to at least report the, that back to you? Yes, to some extent, yes. Uh, it really it really depends on the people you have there um, and on the level of support you have from a management perspective. If you have the support and the mandate to set up that unified umbrella, then you're good to go. Um, and if you can demonstrate to the people that okay, what we are doing here kind of makes sense. And if the people see this the, this sense, then it's easier for them to adopt. So mm -hmm. the best example is, I, it's, it's really very simple. And um, uh, you may laugh at it, but when, whenever somebody new, for example, from an ERP system side is approaching us, so joining their team and has no clue about what we're doing, hey, what's all of that with that semantic again? And you're talking about knowledge graph. <laughs> what the heck is that thing? I'm only telling them a very um, simple example that, hey, um, it's just about knowledge and association, briefly spoken. So when I say blue, what do you think? And now Steve may think of blue, ah, okay, um, that's the ocean. Um, JT may think of, ah, that's the sky. And you're both right with your thinking because both are typical associations for the term or the color um, resource blue. And then as soon as people realize that this is basically what it's about, getting context to the knowledge which we use and accepting the fact that everybody 
and every system may use knowledge in a different context. And that you now are generating a unified layer which makes sense of all the different contexts. As soon as people understand that, then you have their support. Excellent. Excellent. Then just one last question that deviates a little bit from mm -hmm. what you presented so far is that, you know, in regards to the growth, you went from five to 30 and you're probably still in a growth mode and demand has risen. How have you been able to, you know, look at, uh, you know, the resource mix and the skills out in the marketplace and, and uh, are you doing some training? Are you, are you trying to find the right uh, candidates? Uh, talk to us a little bit more about that, uh, uh, challenge as well. That was actually a huge challenge. So luckily, it, you know, really, especially in Europe, there is a big link, link data um, community, I would say. Um, also in Germany, around, around uh, Leipzig there, um, the, um, the paths you can take down their university are all, they have a, a link data. Um, um, study you can take on there. So so it's it's starting to grow. And of course, we will look into that. Um, so besides classical development skills, we were hunting down those people right from the universities, um, working with the partners where uh, we have experience with and finding, for example, link, link data exports. But also, um, uh, really, you know, um, linguistic people who are common and proficient in languages. Um, it, it sounds really um, like crazy, but that's the way it is because the key point is to understand um, what do people mean when they talk about certain data in certain terms. So we have we have uh, linguistic proficiencies in our uh, team who are analyzing language uh, and, and making use out of that. And then we made a lot of internal, um, let's say, attractiveness campaigns saying hey um you all know you all know google you use it every day um some sort of that technology would you like to get your hands on and as i said basically more than half of um, our um, employee base in our uh, company is r d focus um, and you open up such opportunities for them saying hey if you want to take your hands uh, or get your hands dirty at the cool stuff, be welcome to join us. Um, here are some of the proficiency areas we would like you to get um, a sharpened skill set in and you open up a training path for them. We really took a bunch of guys um, from R&D centers all around the world. So guys who, are, who were working at Radio Access Software joined our <laughs> linked data team and are now um developing um sparkle plugins and um, scala plugins which we tie into our data integration component to make use of or to perform business logic executions and events based on our unified data layer yeah. so it was really interesting for that for these people to experience that different kind of technology stack that we had to offer that's how we did it and then, of course, lots of external research. So, searching all these, the LinkedIn, this, this, the things, uh, getting to events, talking to different people. So it was a long, long search and building up the team. As said, uh, it took us four years now to to get from five-ish people to around thirty. Great story. Wonderful story. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions, JT, or also we'll just move on to our next presenter. And of course, uh, uh, join us in the uh, social service if you wanted to uh, as well. And I could I could start one that would actually you know, be, be your table. Yeah, sure. That would be great. All, All right. right. That's going to happen in about... 45. Nah, it's going to be in about two hours, but I know you're, you're, you're uh, it's going to be later in the evening. But if you want to join, I'll, I'll set up that table. Yeah, I'll be there. So if you're interested, then. Thank you. Okay.